So, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this In Conversation with Anne Rainbow. Yes, she does have a marvellous name and I'm going to ask her to explain why she's called Anne Rainbow um, very shortly. So just to let those of you know who are listening, we're going to start off with me asking, I've actually got 18 questions to ask. And then um, after I've, we've, we, I've asked the questions and we've, um, Anne has answered them uh, at length, I would imagine, we can then have a question and answer session. So you'll be able to ask your questions in the chat. You won't be asking them um, verbally because of privacy. I don't want people to um, keep being shown on the screen or have to have their names shared. So I'm going to, you can do that through the chat. If people's videos suddenly pop up on the screen, I am going to hide you again. Uh, I hope you don't think that's too rude of me, but this is being recorded. And so it's important you're not there. So thank you very much, Anne. So please, could you start off by telling us a little bit about you and your writing experience? Who are you? Why are you here? Well, my name's Anne Rainbow, and so we'll come back to that in a minute. Basically, uh, I started writing in 1979 when my son was born. I have two children. He was my second. At that time, we were living in Cornwall, and uh, my husband, my ex-husband, um, he was working away in the week, and I was at home. I had a four-year-old, and I had this typewriter that had been donated to me by my mum, and basically, I was commissioned to write this book, and I wrote it. So that was the first of six books I wrote for that particular publishing company and then later on I became a teacher examiner and I ended up writing a lot of textbooks uh, I was chief examiner for the RSA exam board and I wrote a lot of textbooks um, about 30 or more mm -hmm. I've got listed on LinkedIn um, so and then later I set up my own publishing company with my ex-husband um, which we did copywriting um, sorry copy editing proofreading and indexing as well the publishing in those days there was no self-publishing it was all you know through so now i'm ha ha retired <laughs> um i split my time between my own writing which is now mostly fiction or blogging about scrivener and helping other writers either to use scrivener or or to uh, to self-edit obviously i teach a lot of editing and also to for the mentoring side if they want to publish that's usually what happens and they need a they need a hand Okay, and so why are you Anne Rainbow? Well, um, I had lots and lots of textbooks under my old married name. My old married name was Jenny Lawson. I was born Jennifer Anne Charlton, got married, became Jenny Lawson, and I have I had become quite famous as Jenny Lawson. And then I had a poem that was accepted just after my mum died. I had a bit of a dodgy patch, and I wrote lots of poetry. And my marriage broke up and I wrote more poetry. And then one of my poems got picked up to be published. And I happened to be on the phone to my publisher that day. I was on the phone to them most days. I said, oh, you'll never guess what one of my poems can be published. And she said, not under your name, it's not. To which I, I said, what do you mean? And she said, if you'd like to read your contract, which was about 20 years old, this contract, you'll find you don't have the permission. So I was a bit I had got the contract, I did read it, and she was right. I mean, I hadn't, I had read the contract. It had my name on it, it told me how much royalties I was gonna get, mm -hmm. and it told me the dates I was gonna be paid. That's all, I, it was, it was a, like an 18 page document. But when I actually read it, in the fine print, it said I couldn't publish under my own name without their permission. So I said to her, I phoned her back and said, yes, you're quite right, uh, so now what do I do? She said, well, just pick another name, easy. And at that time, I had become known as Rainbow Maker on a lot of writers' sites because I started sailing and I was good at creating rainbows, positioning the boat and the sun and the waves. Uh, you can, if you all stand at the pointed end of the boat and jump, this was a 60-foot yacht I was on, you could make the boat dip, hit a wave, create a bow wave, and you'd see a rainbow. So I was known as Rainbow Maker. And so I thought, and Rainbow. And that's how she, she actually existed for two years without anybody knowing apart from me and about, about three or four close friends. Um, and then, <clears throat> then my ex-husband got remarried. And I, you know, like you just wake up one morning, and you think I can't be, I can't be Jenny Lawson anymore, ever. So I, when I signed the papers, I got my solicitor to change my name by default. Mm. And, and I've been Anne Rainbow ever since. 
Wow, well, it's a beautiful name and it's a memorable name. Very memorable. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so I, know, I didn't forget you and I met you a few <laughs> years ago, but I couldn't forget you. <laughs> okay, so um, I've, you've told me a little bit about the, about the editing that you do. You run a business that you call Red Editing Pen. No, it's called Red Pen Editing. It's called Red Pen, and Red I get pen. it wrong every time. So it's called Red Pen, pen. Editing. See, Anne Rainbow is easy to remember. Red <laughs> Pen Editing. Red Editing Pen is not. <laughs> Which order does it come in? Well, basically, Red Pen, because, um, you know, you use a red pen for editing. Uh, yeah. Basically, that was created oh, a, a long, long time ago within writing sites. Um, there, were, there was a writing site the BBC set up, and then there were other ones that I joined. And Red Pen was a one of the groups within one of those writing sites when it first formed. And it was simply a group that encouraged people to edit their stories before they showed them to anybody else. Because I was conscious that part of the reason why people weren't getting their work published was because it was not good enough to be published. And without saying that out loud, I simply said, I think it could do with a bit of a polish. Let's get the old red pen out. So the red pen group was formed of a there were about i don't know 20 30 of us and we had we mostly short stories in those days flash fiction and short stories and so they came into red pen as a group gay they posted up their rough story the first draft and then they were given tasks to do so the red pen tasks grew out of that group um i eventually moved from that site to another site to another site and it landed up within the scrivener virgin website you can see it from the menu. It says red pen, simply the best. Um, and that leads you into, so I call Scrivener Virgin the gatekeeper of a red pen. It's the way in. And it's been housed on there well ever since I've had that website. I see. So just to explain to those who don't know, why Scrivener Virgin? So that's your, that's your <laughs> website, Scrivener Virgin. So why, what is Scrivener? <laughs> what is a virgin? Why, why, why are you Scrivener Virgin? <laughs> Well, again, this is really just, um, if you like, clever marketing on my part. I learnt to use Scrivener, and I was a virgin, as in the Madonna song. I am a virgin, but not quite her virgin version. Uh, I, was new, I was brand new to Scrivener, and I absolutely adored it. I looked at the other people who were putting stuff out. You need to explain what Scrivener, Scrivener is. Which, uh, there was the expert, Gwen Hernandez. Scrivener is a writing tool for writers. Basically, it's a place to put all of your writing in, in, in a single place. So you have all of the manuscript and you have your reference materials and load of other stuff all in one place. And um, I chose the word Scrivener version because it would not be forgotten. Um, it raises a smile. And it isn't, um, it isn't forgotten. So yeah. Scrivener Virgin is a tool. Is it just is it a, just a filing system? So can I put my poems in there, my short stories, my articles, and put them all? And it's just an elaborate filing system that somebody else has organised for me. The uh, well, the Scrivener version itself is my website where I put everything. But basically, Scrivener, the software tool, is yes, it is a, a like a binder effect. You can put all of your work in. I can show you a screen at, later on. Mm. Um, but essentially, for one particular novel, you probably have everything for that novel in one Scrivener project. And then for a different novel, or all your short stories could be in one Scrivener project, or all your poems. I've got all my poems in a Scrivener project. Um, and I've got all my Scrivener tips in one Scrivener project, and all my editing tips in another Scrivener project. So it's a collection of things that are like each other, if you like, or it's equal to one book. Most of the novelists I'm working with have one Scrivener project for that one book. So why is Scrivener better than just using a folders on a computer? The, it's because it's all in one place uh, and you can do a lot of sort of cross-referencing between them. There's a, there's a thing called metadata, which is at the heart of Scrivener. And uh, things like uh, I write in scenes and each of my scenes has a title, which is not going to be seen by the end reader, but it helps me to see the structure of my book. Each of those scenes also has a synopsis uh, describing what happens within that scene, the action, who's, you know, which characters are in it and so on, what themes I'm addressing, what the outcomes are of that, that scene. So I can actually create an outline without writing any words of the manuscript, just using what we call the corkboard view of Scrivener. And uh, then I can get down to the writing. So my annual event is NaNoWriMo in November, the National Novel Writers Month. Mm -hmm. But September, I don't allow myself to start till September the 1st, otherwise 
the whole year would go. But in September, I start planning the next novel. I write my court board cards out. And then by the time I get to the 1st of November, I should have the whole novel planned. Only ever happens once, to be honest, because I usually run out of time. Uh, the more I have planned, the better, um, you know, for writing the whole thing. So, um, but at Scrivener itself has allowed you to do editing. It's not just a writing tool. It allows you to do editing in the most efficient way. So this is something that I advocate. I want people to enjoy. I think everyone enjoys the writing of their novels. They don't enjoy the editing. Um, and I try to make it more enjoyable by making it more efficient, but mainly to the red pen editing um, strategy is to avoid editing overwhelm. That's the, that's the thing that makes people give up. Mm, um, interesting. Mm. Interesting. Well, that's 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 fascinating. Thank you for explaining how Strip Scrivener works, because I now can see how incredibly useful that would be for mm. a longer piece of work, like yes. writing a memoir, yep. because it's all about the planning, isn't it? Yes, it makes also, a big difference. Even if you're a pantser, which I was when I first started doing Nano, and you produce this, you know, fifty thousand plus words, which is a right mess. If you pull it into Scrivener, or if you wrote it in Scrivener in the first place, you can then break it up. You can analyze it. You can see where the gaps are. You can start filling in those gaps. You can do things like uh, identify only the scenes where Charlie is involved. So you can you can read only those scenes on the screen and check the constant uh, mm. the, the continuity and the consistency. You can have on the screen the scene and Charlie's um, character sketch. So, you know, he started off with blue eyes. By the time you got to chapter 17, his eyes had gone a funny green colour. So, you know, that kind of thing, you can, you can do lots using Scrivener that you wouldn't be able to do using something like Word or whatever other software people are using. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Well, let's get on to the business of editing. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is cutting. <laughs> when I was first starting off as a, as a writer, I was in my early 20s and I remember I met a real life journalist and he said, I'm going to give you one piece of advice, Joanna, cut and cut and cut again. <laughs> and so do you think that cutting is the most important part of editing? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I call it pruning because uh, that doesn't sound quite so aggressive. Um, I actually have eight separate self-editing courses. So it's only one eighth of the story, if you like. Um, so uh, I do look at pruning, yes, but there's also structure and balance, which is important, which might mean cutting out scenes or cutting out characters even, but it might be putting more in. Dialogue's really important. Uh, how you introduce people, how you use place and how you use props is really important. So those kinds of things are, uh, are important for editing and, and the pruning, I tend to suggest people do a light prune to start, uh, just to kind of, if you like, trim it into shape. Um, before they then look at their structure and then worry about a lot of other stuff. But the final job should also be a really strict prune as much as you get rid of anything that you can delete. Uh, as you say, cut, cut, cut. If, it, if the word isn't worth its weight in gold, it shouldn't be there. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you worry too much about cutting, you, you lose sight of your structure, you lose sight of how the dialogue needs to flow. You know, everything has to work. So... so so what would you say the easiest things to cut up? I mean, some people don't know what to cut at all. So well, where's a good place to start? Um, I, would be, <laughs> I would be inclined to think about things like adverbs and adjectives. Uh, obviously, it's down to your, your writing style. But I mean, Hemingway uh, famously said, you know, just cut them out before you even begin. And if you use a piece of software uh, like Pro Writing Aid, I use that as my VA, I call it my virtual assistant. Um, it is a piece of software. Therefore, it's not as good as a human. Um, however, it will highlight words, what you might call um, wasted words, you know, things like actually and really and very and almost and literally waffly things. Mm. And sometimes they're very useful in dialogue because you want that person to come over as waffly um, or, or evasive even. But in your main narrative, it needs to be as, um, as, as crisp as you can make it uh, and easy for your reader. Uh, to, to get you know to get the journey going um but i think uh, i would start with if you really are struggling and you want to get the word count down you need to think about what information you're trying to get across and make sure that you haven't gone off at a tangent um so that you know you might end up actually losing a whole scene because you don't need it 
Yeah, I can see that. Uh, on the subject of cutting, even though I am digressing from the list of questions I sent you okay. earlier to prepare, um, <laughs> one thing that I tend to it, in, encourage people to cut is when I consider that they're writing perhaps too many polysyllabic words next to each other. And I call that lumpy um, mm. because you can end up, I, I believe that if you trip over it in your tongue, if, you, if your tongue trips over it when you're reading it aloud, your tongue mm. also trips over it in your head. Yeah. And so I would always try and cut anything that's really too, too lumpy and too, too many words together. What, what do you think about that? Yes, if you, if you um, I tend to read mine aloud uh, and record it on my phone. I don't do, you know, big chunks. I do maybe a scene at a time, then listen back to it. I mean, obviously, you don't like to hear the sound of your own voice. That's, everyone feels that way. But if you're, in, if you're in a room and no one else is going to hear it, that's okay. And as you say, when you're trying to speak it, if you're stumbling when you're trying to speak it yourself, there's clearly something wrong. And if you think, well, it's okay, but then when you listen back to it, you think, oh, no. You know, I mean, there are situations where you might start uh, several sentences with there was, there was, there was. And you think, no, 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 no. I need to. It's not just cutting. It's also variety. So that, you know, you don't sound like um, a dripping tap, basically. Uh, so it, de it depends very much on the writer as to what they need to cut. Because everyone's got their own style. Mm. Uh, there might be some who I never use adverbs. Don't, don't, you know, they, they, they'll say, I can't cut any adverbs. I don't have any. It's like when you go to the doctors and they say, go on a diet, cut out biscuits. And you say, I haven't had a biscuit for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, each to their own. But, you you know, and there are people who, I mean, Christine, who we both know, she, she uses very rich vocabulary. And I wouldn't suggest for a moment that she, that she cuts any of that because she paints pictures with her words. My writing is not like her writing. I don't, I don't paint pictures that way. I paint tension. Oh, I try to paint tension. So oh, mine's, mine's through dialogue mostly. Um, so it depends on the writer. It honestly depends on the writer. Yeah, it depends on the writer and it depends on their voice. And you shouldn't try mm. and change your voice because your voice is you. You just had to maybe grow into it and learn to accept that's who I am and that's okay. And you just, yeah. I suppose then you, you really are aiming for consistency. If you're... Um, when you're very new to writing it's a bit like trying on new clothes you know you you breathe in and you stand straight and what have you and you think oh that looks okay but actually after you've been wearing that outfit for half an hour you know you can't breathe <laughs> it's you know it's just not comfortable <laughs> and so I think with writing you write and you write and you write and and then suddenly you read something and you think actually I'm really pleased I wrote that and you're not really sure why what it is about it but you've found your rhythm uh you've found your humor sometimes it's the humor that comes through um, or somebody said to me once, you know, your dialogue's very good, which I immediately assumed they meant the rest wasn't, you know, you do, don't you? When, if someone gives you a compliment, you immediately flip it. Um, but essentially, finding your voice is a slow process. It's not something that happens over a weekend. Mm, I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah, thank you. It was inter interesting insights there, Anne. Thank you very much. Um, do you think that we are all completely capable of editing our own work or do you think that it is better to call in a third party? And if the answer to that is both, at what point do you think it's worth going to a third party? Well, going to a third party is going to involve paying money, usually. Mm -hmm. There is an interim uh, stage where you might have friends, you might belong to a group and you do swaps. So you might not pay them in cash, but you have to pay them in time because you're going to have to read their stuff while they're reading yours. So. I would recommend that uh, writers avoid sharing their writing until such time as they've, they've done as best they can with their editing. Now, the level of their best they can will vary from writer to writer, but you can use things like Pro Writing Aid and Grammarly and all those other similar things to actually sort out the, the bare bones so that you have a certain amount of confidence when you hand it over. And then um, make it as clean as you can. If, you, if you're using Word or Scrivener, there's spelling check, spell checks and what have you that puts wiggly lines or double underlines in blue, which indicates there is an error. So if you at least fix those before you give it to anybody else, and then when it comes to giving it to somebody else to have a look at, uh, obviously this is a very sensitive thing for most people because it's like their creation, their baby, and they are very worried about what people are going to say back. And equally, the person who receives it will be really worried about upsetting you because... Mm. If it turns out that what you've produced is really not ever so good, um, then 
how are they going to say that to you without without upsetting you when i was first setting up red pen i had a fellow writer called patsy davis who's now written hundreds of uh, short stories and when i say hundreds i mean like 500 short stories been published in women's magazines and she's written, I don't know how many novels, I've lost, I've lost count of her novels. But the very first time she upped from a short story to a 2,000 word story, it was a uh, story called Family Recipe. And frankly, and she won't mind me saying this because we've discussed it several times over, um, it was a great idea, badly executed. Um, she had broken just about every rule in the book as to how she'd done it. Um, however, it was worth editing and we... Between us in red pen, I we do three tasks at a time. We had 17 tasks, so we went through six times, six circles of her self-editing, and then it was published. It was accepted for publication. So even the the worst executed story, breaking every rule in the book, you can with guidance edit it, edit it, edit it, edit it, and produce something which is publishable. And that's the process anyone goes in writing a novel. You write the first draft, it's bound to be not good. Um, it's bound to be you know, the best you could do in the circumstances. But through levels of editing, you can raise your game. The professional editor that you might employ at the very end of the process, um, I think is essential just to keep up the standards of what gets printed. But having said that, I mean, I do know people who've, got, who've paid for this and paid for that and paid for the other but they get conflicting advice back from these different editors. The bottom line is, it's your work, it's your words. Um, you're the one who's going to be judged based on what it is. You have to take ownership. But I, th I do think you should use um, every um, other device open to you to help you. So my own, my own process, I write my draft, nobody sees it, but nobody sees it. Um, I then put it through Pro Writing Aid um, in a... Uh, the way I do it is I put a scene through which will throw up some things that I'm doing as far as it's concerned wrong. I then apply them to the whole manuscript. So I don't put every scene through. I just get a measure of the style of writing I've been using. It then goes through a review group. I belong to a, a local group called Rear View. And there's, uh, currently there's five of us. And we meet monthly by Zoom at the moment. And uh, so they see a chapter at a time and that's, uh, I get feedback from all of them and then I edit it again. And I also have recently joined the Joan Dempsey uh, Gutsy Novelist Group and I'm in working with four other novelists and we're swapping chapter for chapter. So by the time it's been through um, Pro Writing Aid once plus Rear View, Pro Writing Aid again at a very deep level and then three or four other reviews I think it's as good as it's going to get hmm. I think it's time to let go and let it and call it done call those chapters done mm -hmm. um so uh but some people uh, might need more help I mean I actually know how to structure a book so I don't actually need a developmental editors I actually work as a developmental editor so you know if I can't work my own out then I'm in a bad state um I also am obviously a copy editor so I can correct my own text but I would still run it past a proofreader before it goes to print. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I interesting. Something. interesting. So lots and lots of um, process there. Um, yes. So on that subject, um, how long do you think is an optimum amount of time to leave a first draft before you go back and look at it again? Well, I would, I would say as long as possible. I mean, literally, I tend to leave it about a year. Uh, I, I mean, I do one nano novel um, because I do another one each year. But I've still got last year's and the year before and the year before and the year before that I could I could spend time on. So I tend to um, do the nano anyway because it's an optimum time for me to actually do a lot of writing. But then when I get, you know, have Christmas when everyone, I don't know what's going to happen this year, but in normal years I have Christmas when I reconnect with the family and they remember who I am. January is kind of grim. And February I think, okay, which novel am I going to work on this year? And it's not the one I just worked on. Mm -hmm. um, this year I'm working on the 2018 one. And there are earlier ones that I got so far with, and then I ran out of time. So, um, interesting. I would leave it as long as you can. If you can't bear to leave it very long, or perhaps you haven't even finished writing, then I would give it at least a month uh, after Nano, because there's all the other stuff going on, Christmas and New Year and things, uh, and come back to it. You know, when the weather's pretty grim and you can't go in the garden and stuff, um, you might think, okay, I'll do a couple of hours on my novel every day and chip away at it. Um, mm. But the more distance you have, 
um, as an editor, you, you, you can't have the emotional ties. That's the important thing. Yeah. You, you mustn't be precious about your own words. You must be quite, it's quite, I've, it was a joke actually. I think I've posted it already because I scheduled them uh, where a woman's on a beach with her husband and she says, oh, I don't remember this book at all. I think, you know, and he says, well, who wrote it? She said, well, I did. <laughs> you know, so if you can get enough distance from your book that you don't even remember writing it, that's perfect because you can be mm. as objective as you need to be. Um, in your in your editing no oh, okay thank you very much well i want to ask you a question which i know and i know already that you're not going to agree with me that <laughs> i i recommend that people who work with me on some on a longer piece of work and i don't do <clears throat> i don't work with fiction i work with non-fiction right. i always say that i i advocate that they start at the beginning and they write from the the they write they polish chapter one to make sure to get their voice the consistency, the roadmap, the the style they're going to write in, the ingredients they're going to put into into that into each chapter, and get that as polished as possible. And then I say, now write a shitty first draft from chapter two to the end, and don't go back and fiddle with earlier chapters until you've got to the end, so that you don't break your flow. So, what do you think about that? This is this is for nonfiction books. Yes. So, well, yes, I mean, I've written a lot of nonfiction books in my, in my time, and I, I would use a top-down approach um, in as much as I would, most of mine were um, for exam books, you know, textbooks for pe to help people pass. I was a chief examiner, I devised the exam, I wrote the syllabus, I then, and then I ended up writing the book, or me and the team of people would write the book. Um, and so I'd start off with the main headings. My chapter headings would be dictated by the topics that the exam covered. My subheadings would be dictated by what subjects within that and so on. But I would have worked out in, in conjunction with the publisher, the features, the exercises, you know, the checklists or tips or something. So you're right, your attitude to your chapter one, you'd work out the, um, what we would call the format of every chapter is going to include an introductory paragraph. Uh, there's then going to be say five main topics and under those some subtopics, there's going to be X number of diagrams because that's what the budget allows um and there's going to be uh examinations on you know test questions at the end of every section and at the end of every chapter some kind of cheery message uh to, to launch them into the next one um and i yes i would just start from the, the top and work my way through i think it's different in, in fiction um, because people start off with an idea they they have some you know they might just overhear a conversation where a spark comes to them and they want to write a whole novel about it um, and so, I mean, for example, I was on holiday once, I won't give you all the details because it's personal, but in a conversation, one man said, it's all about the money. And my reaction was when you get to our age, you'll realize it's nothing to do with the money. And then, and then that's when the fight started basically. Um, but I, I went, I came away thinking, you know, there are people who have his, uh, approach to life. And I wanted to write a novel about, it's all about the money. Actually, it's not all about the money. So I had that as my theme, if you like. And then I started picking characters and deciding who I was going to throw into the melting pot. So when I first started writing it, I thought I had it in my head. Um, and that was one of the ones I did plan for. So I did write out the scene plans. It were. But once you get writing, the characters go and do their own thing. Yeah, no, you know, so, so you, can't, you can't be completely prescriptive and you don't want to be, but otherwise you feel like you're in a straitjacket. Um, and it, I think after you've, I mean, certainly after Nano, I say, I put it aside, I come back to it, then I read it and think, oh my goodness, you know, then I start analysing it and seeing what I've got, what I want to keep, what I want to develop. Um, which, I mean, I might ditch the original theme if mm. it turns out another thing came up. Yeah. Um, I think it's important um, to, for each writer, some people I know like to write chapter one, even if fiction or non-fiction, they want to write chapter one and polish it before they move on to chapter two. My only worry is that they'll never get to chapter 17. Mm. You, know, you know, life will pass them by. Mm. Um, so if they, uh, if they enjoy the process of writing, just write it. Don't worry about how good or bad it is. You know, anything can be edited. You can't blank edit a blank page. <laughs> but and it really doesn't matter um, how how bad that first draft is. I mean, Patsy's first draft, when I did a workshop based on it, because I, I did ask her, can we do a workshop? I asked people to read it and then tell me what three things they'd fix. And one man who will remain nameless said, I'd put it straight in the bin. It's not worth working on. 
And I said, well, that's where you're wrong, because she did work on it and it has been published. Mm. Um, so I think where people are um, worried about how bad their first draft is, it, it can be really, 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 really bad, but you can still salvage it with help. Mm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I, I like the, your term, the top down approach. I would always recommend that people start off with a, a contents list or an outline. So oh, yeah. that if, even though I always say it's organic and it would shift along the way because you'll have ideas and you'll realize that some things don't work and some things need adding and that sort of thing. But to start off with a table of contents to use as your roadmap, I find incredibly mm. helpful. The other thing, the difference between fiction and nonfiction is that with a nonfiction, you tend to start off with an idea you're going to cover a certain amount of scope because you want to deliver a certain amount of knowledge. That's what your, your aim is. With a fiction book, you don't really know how long or short it's going to be when you start. It could be it could become incredibly long or it could become just a novella. Um, and I tend to, uh, I, well, I recommend people to write in themes, not in chapters, because uh, chapters don't need to be the same length. You're not packaging it particularly. And it's only after you've written the scenes that you think are necessary for your characters that you begin to go back and think about the order in which you want to deliver those scenes, uh, how you're going to spill it out, you know, how you're going to play your cards, if you like. Um, and then after that, you can worry about how you're going to group them, because some chapters can be very short and some can be longer. Uh, and the length of the chapter can indicate the importance of the person who has the point of view for that chapter. Uh, and if you, um, one particular book I've analysed and presented a course on, uh, Claire McIntosh's I See You, if you analyse the length of her chapters, towards the end, they get shorter and shorter and shorter and they swap point of view. And, and it, you can feel the pace. It's like a race. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the baddie versus the goodies, baddies, goodies, baddies and so on. And you, you just keep quickly turning the pages. Um, and at the beginning, the main character has more pages. So you know they're the main character. So how you group scenes into chapters tells a lot more than just the number of words. Mm. It's a lot, you know, the balance of the whole book can be constructed by themes and, and Scrivener works in themes, which makes it easier. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. And I absolutely, I advocate that, that idea of writing in scenes. I think that's great. <clears throat> um, I would just like to go back to the editing per se again and ask mm -hmm. you what you think about the term that they say that everybody should murder their children. <laughs> well, um, yeah, my, I've got two children. There was one occasion when I actually wrote a CV and I emailed it to my daughter um, to say, could she just check it was okay? And she, she emailed me back and said, you seem to have forgotten a couple of things. And I said, oh, what's that, my love? She said, your children, you have deleted your children from your CV. So I did say to her, well, if I include them, no one will believe I've achieved that much in my lifetime because how did I fit two kids in? She said, well, you didn't really fit us in, did you, mum? So anyway, that's an, that's an aside, but no, I, uh, this, this phrase obviously refers to things that you very much like about your story and you don't want to lose it. Um, so it is, it is easy to become overly attached to parts of your story. Um, so I'd hold back on that killing spree. You know, don't, don't feel you have to do it until that first draft is written and you've, you've had a stab at um, a, st a stab at a first edit. Um, and then, and then also, Again, don't take it out until you get some feedback because it's only when somebody else says to you, I don't know why that scene is there, then you think, oh, yeah, I know I ought to have taken it out, but I just liked it. Mm. Um, I actually reviewed somebody's work the other day and the opening um, few scenes was about a sex um, encounter by a, a businessman away from home. It was quite graphic, you know, didn't leave anything to the imagination at all. But at the end of that uh, little chapter, he then gets on a plane and dies in a plane crash. To which my, and then the next chapter is all about his wife and how she copes post his death. To which I said to him, you know, why did you include it? And the answer is because he liked to have a bit of sex at the opening part of his story. And do you know what? It did nothing. Mm, yeah. um, it, it, it painted the scene of this book's going to have a lot of sex in it. But you know, I'd, maybe it's a man woman thing, I don't know, but I, I didn't need it there. And I felt quite cheated when I, well, I was quite pleased he died because he wasn't a nice person. But, you know, it was, it, it, we didn't need it. And sometimes you think you need a scene, but you don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're not sure, leave it in. And then when, when somebody has the nerve to say to you, because they might not have the nerve to say to you, I think that scene can come out. You could say, well, why do you think that? Hmm. I've actually had people, I'm, I'm currently got to write some extra material for chapter 20 for my Deadwood. 
um, but because I, I glossed over a situation and the review comments that I want the details. I want the nitty gritty details. I'm like, oh, really? Mm, yeah. So with editing, with it's definitely it's editing the grammar. It's editing. It's editing the content. It's doing that yourself, and then it's getting feedback from other people. And there are people who are nervous to get feedback from others. But uh, I always say that it, you you've got to. You cannot keep your cards close to your t chest because you've right. got no idea how good it might be. No, as well as as how yeah. as how much might need changing so i think it's time that they you told them you're about your red pen editing cycle right well the cycle itself shall i share the circle does that yes help? i think that would yeah. be fantastic I, and then talk I, over the top of it and explain what yeah, it's about okay i'll see if i can manage that <laughs> um share the screen that one hopefully this is now going to come up on your screen it is yes that's excellent yeah okay excellent. so basically there are 10 steps uh there's only two of them in red that's when you're actually doing some editing the, the other ones in blue are where you're doing thinking and planning uh so steps one two and three are preparation one is turn off the creativity tap so allow for the fact that editing is different from writing if you are writing you should be creative that's the whole you know the thing if you're not feeling creative it's quite hard to write um, but if you are editing, we don't want too much creativity. We want some objectivity. So in order to um, get your head in gear, you then need to create distance as well. Now that can just be uh, overnight. It can be, you know, go and have some lunch, come back and then work on it again. Um, but you need to have some distance, the longer the better. And the, th the third point is choose your moment. Because if you start your editing um, session with, oh, this is going to go wrong, I hate editing, uh, you're going to make a pretty bad job of it, frankly. Um, so choosing your moment, you know, making sure that you're in the right mood, um, uh, talk yourself into it. So those first three are preparation stages. Number four, five, six and seven are when we study the content and come up with a plan, effectively. So studying the content, I recommend that you, depending on where you are in your cycle, because we go around this circle lots and lots of times. Um, and if you are, if this, this is the first time through, what I would recommend is you're in your head, you have five questions that you've got, you want to ask yourself. Um, basically, how does it start and how does it end? So these are kind of gut feelings, the opening lines and, the, and how you feel at the very end. But in the middle, um, whether it kind of flowed, whether the story flowed, maybe what the characters were like, uh, whatever things are relevant to you, how the dialogue was maybe. So you decide you're, that's what you're going to study. So maybe you record the, the story or the chapter and then you listen to it or you're in a review group and somebody else reads it out for you. That's really, really useful. Um, so you're studying it, uh, listening with your ears or reading it on the page. Lots of different ways of doing it. But the end result should be, yeah, that was quite good. Oh, I'm not happy with that. Whatever. You just make notes to yourself. There are then three really big questions. Are you using the right tense? Because whether you're using past tense or present tense makes a huge difference to the delivery of the story. Uh, if you listen to the story and think, yeah, I'm in the right tense, good. If you listen to it or somebody says, maybe it would work better if you were in present tense, that's a massive change because every sentence is going to need fixing. Um, number six is, are you speaking in the right voice? Have you chosen the appropriate point of view character? to tell this story. And again, if you've chosen the right person, yippee, but if you haven't, and you need to look at the scene again from another person's perspective, um, that's basically a rewrite of that scene. And the structure and balance is um, another, there's quite a lot of things in that checklist basically. But four, five, six, and seven are reviewing either a scene or a chapter or even a whole novel, and coming up with a list of things that you know you need to, to deal with. When you get to step eight, there's two sections. One is the, um, the planning side and the other part is the execution. On the planning side, you look at your list of 17 tasks that you think you need to do and you pick three of them, only three, and you pick a, you pick a selection, like something really easy that will take you five minutes, something that's a bit more challenging that might take you a couple of hours, something that's really hard, you're gonna have to think about it before you do any changes. So you make yourself a kind of smorgasbord of tasks and then you just do those three tasks. So the execution is just those three tasks. You've still got all those others sitting there. Um, drill down is when you look at paragraphs, sentences, words, and punctuation. 
Some people do this every time they go around the circle because they're a bit fanatical about it. Other people say, do you know what? I can leave that till the end. Um, if you've got to the point of step nine or eight and you think, okay, I've done my three tasks, you go back to number one. So you give yourself some distance. You create uh, the right sort of circumstances. You know you've done three tasks, so it should be better than last time. Uh, you've already got your hit list of things you know need addressing still, but you try and look at your story or your chapter again objectively. And you hopefully you're going, yep, yeah, that's better, that's better. Mm, still not happy with that. So when you get to step eight again, you choose three more tasks from your list and do those. Uh, only when you've been around, 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 and you think there are no more tasks for you to do, you're pretty not happy but you know you can't do any more you ask the feedback you make sure that you have drilled down that every sentence is a sentence it has the right punctuation you haven't screwed up on any of the spellings that kind of thing and then you send it out for, for feedback um and that's when you sort of sit back and think you know brace myself because what's going to come back is their version of four five six and seven they'll have looked at your content they'll have asked themselves are you using the right tense they might not have these questions in their head, but they will feed back the kinds of answers that would be answers to those questions. And they might say something like, I really like Harry, but um, he, you know, I can't see him. I can't see him. I need more, more description. Or they might say, um, you know, so-and-so's so dialogue is really wooden. So that kind of thing will come back to you. So then you're going to get some extra tasks from them. So you go to step eight, you decide which of those tasks you're going to tackle, only three at a time, and then you go back to step one. And then you, so you process all of the feedback, get yourself to a position where you think, okay, it's now as good as I can get. You look elsewhere for more feedback. And you just keep going around in that circle again and again and again. My goodness, until you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, funny thing, the funny thing about it is that if you, where it works really, really well is if you look at a story and think, oh my God, everything, everything's wrong with it. Everything, there's nothing right. I like three words out of the whole story. Um, you can actually just pick on, you know, three little things um, that you'll fix. And each time you fix more and get some kind of uh, feedback, maybe. I mean, when I'm working with writers, I see every draft. So I can then say, wow, you've sorted that out. Well done. That's really good. Mm. Um, things like show versus tell. Um, I might mm. say, I might give feedback saying you're doing a lot of tell. It, it, it would be better if you tried to show some stuff. Writers don't necessarily understand that the first time round. So they have a shot at it and they don't really manage it. So then I give more detailed feedback as to what I what they what I really meant I mean I really meant the same thing in the first place but sometimes you have to hear something over and over again before it sinks in what you actually mm. need to do to to achieve that well um so if you'd like to take the screen away now I yeah. want to ask you a question about something that you've mentioned and uh, I think that the listeners will be really interested to know a bit more about that if you could stop sharing yep, the screen yep, okay. um you talked about the 17 things that you have to do <laughs> where where what are the 17 things or can you no, tell us where we can find the 17 things um, well basically in, in the book itself i do go i have a checklist of things which you can uh, you, you haven't tick. told them what the book is you need to perhaps show them a quick uh, quickly share your screen and show them what your oh, book is get that one out hang on a sec uh, um i think it's in that one it's a very useful book i have it myself as well okay so i need to find how i can share the screen again let me just get to the right place you get all these different screens. Oh no. Um that one. That's that. Share. It's called Editing the Red Pen Way. Hopefully that's coming up on your screen. Mm. <clears throat> um it's available on Amazon. It's two pounds ninety-nine and it is uh it, it has that diagram in it. Explain the same, hopefully the same as what I just explained. I did that um, you know, without any notes basically. And then uh for each of those um, steps, it has a checklist and you can, you can download the checklist um, so that you can then tick it off for yourself if you want to. But it's things like um, with characters, you know, where do they come in? Where do they leave? I mean, one of the things that quite often goes wrong with, uh, with writers is that they, um, one, one particular author I was working with a short while ago in her book too, 
she had a guy in a particular place who was quite instrumental in the story and then suddenly we never heard from him again what happened to him mm, yeah. so it's you know loose ends if you like um and so for every one of those 10 steps there are suggestions and there are checklists as appropriate um on, on how to do those so yeah, go to Amazon and... Um... Excellent, thank you. So um, wh while you've been talking, it's, it's, I, it's made me think, you, you talk an awful lot about fiction, but the, the same rules apply to somebody writing a memoir because a memoir yeah. has got to be written with a plot and characters and scene Absolutely. and everything else. So it's exactly the same principles that one yeah. needs to apply. <clears throat> the only thing, I mean, if you're writing a non-fiction book, you might not have the issues of uh, tense because there is, you don't get a choice, basically. Um, uh, I, when I was writing my textbooks I used to have two voices one which was a you must do this like there was no argument you will do this and the other one was you might like to do this which was kind of you know you, you get a choice here um, so I used to use different words uh, different verbs and constructed mm. the verbs differently so it came across like a bark if you were to do this without any argument and it came across quite gentle if it was something you could actually you know you had some kind of leeway on and i think if you if you can develop your voice um in non-fiction quite early on and have the right tone and everything that that works really well um but usually i say tense is usually past tense in in non-fiction well <clears throat> it, it is and it isn't because there are an awful lot of memoirs that are written in the present tense <clears throat> memoir, which, yeah yes yeah. yes um Okay, thank you. Well, actually, I think we have, um, you've answered all the questions that I, I had asked you. So I think it's time to turn over to, to some questions from the audience. So thank you very much for that. I think there's an awful lot of material. I think £2.99 is not a huge amount to spend on the, on Anne's book. I've, I've got it. It's really worth it for those checklists because there are so many things you won't, you won't have thought about. Um, so that's great. And so I can just see that Sarah's asked, uh, what is nano? That is nano-rimo. I shall write it in the chat for you. Nano-rimo. It sure. is National Novel Writing Month and it's every November and it, people are encouraged to write a thousand words a day, is it? It's 1,666 words a day, 50,000. Oh, 50,000 in 30 days. But you can write more or you can write less. I mean, you know, it's, that's kind of like the bog standard target 50,000 words is never going to be a novel but it will break the back of the novel for you mm, okay great so that's that's good and um yes yeah, so nano can be quite a useful thing to set yourself a target and say i'm mm. going to write it in november so i, I like the, the fact that you do that and that's great and doreen has asked about scrivener um doreen's uh, about to uh, publish a book and she's published some other books in the past and um, she would like to know if there's a friendly way to ease into Scrivener. She sometimes gets bogged down and overwhelmed. The, um, right, well, it, Scrivener's got a lot of features and I would, I would suggest you stick on a, a sort of a needs must basis, only learn about the things you need to use. And each time you need to do something slightly differently, then you could explore another feature. I do have a 14 day, um, I ought to change that really because 14 days is a bit trays description. I don't know anyone who's done it in 14 days apart from one man who's been in correspondence with me for the last fortnight and it would appear he is doing one of my lessons a day. He can't be doing anything else. He can't be sleeping or eating or anything. Um, but essentially uh, I've put together a series of links to the literature and latte videos which are brilliant um, and also my own blog posts which supplement that. So some reading, some watching and lots of exercises and it takes you through the basics. So Doreen, if you go to, um, um, I see, yeah, go to my website and just type in 14 as a query uh, search, it, the page will come up for you. Um, yeah, but it's you just one day at a time, learn it as you go. I do publish the Scrivener tip every day on Facebook, on the Scrivener Virgin Facebook page. And you might look at those and think, yeah, I know that. Or you might think, oh, that's clever. Or what is she talking about? You know, something you didn't even realise was possible. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, D Doreen's just asked, is it the Red Pen website or her personal? It's the Scrivener Virgin. I yeah, shall, Scrivener it's... Virgin website, yeah. Actually, I'll get the 14-day oh, page just up spelled... for you. Yeah, let me just get that up. I've just spelled Scrivener wrong. It's hard. I know. Yeah, right. right, okay, thank you. Uh, Carolyn has asked, what are your three Top, your top three tips for editing somebody else's work 
Um, I would, uh, I'd always read it through more than once um, because your initial reaction might not be what's going to happen, you know, when you read it through a second time or even a third time. Mm. So, so hold back on commenting before you've read it through at least once. Um, I would, um, I would be aware that what your what the writer wants to know is the effect on you as a person rather than me as a an editor or me as a writer so rather than saying oh yes you know you've um you've broken this rule and that rule and the other rule rules are very subjective anyway um so so make sure that you are referring to the writing not the writer and referring to its effect on you not your belief system as far as how one ought to write stories um and even if you even if you look at it and think oh my god if they just did xyz that would make it perfect don't tell them that simply couch it as a question um along the lines of i'm just trying to see if i can do this to everybody um everyone there they are um couch it along the lines of i'm confused by or i don't quite understand here or it, earlier you said this but now you're saying that I don't perhaps I misread it so always put it back onto yourself as to you are the person who's having difficulty with reading their story obviously the reason you're having reading it having difficulty reading is they haven't written it brilliantly and if they were to fix that then obviously it would be better for you but don't ever start off with in paragraph 17 you um, you contradicted what you've said in paragraph 13 be more careful I mean that would just be awful thing to say um, so yeah, be bear in mind that they are human and they have frailties um, and they are putting it out to you not as a, I mean, if I'm mentoring somebody, I'm more brutal, obviously, but if it's somebody who just, I'm reviewing writer to writer, I behave like a reader, not a writer. Oh, very in interesting comment. In my feedback. Yeah. But if I'm working with someone on a mentoring basis, you know, time is money. Effectively, I will, I will open with some positive, obviously find some positive things to say um about how this is much better than last time or how you this made you laugh or this made you smile or you really got caught up in the story something which is reinforcing the value of what you've read and then say um it's coming along nicely uh, you know as so if i'm working as a mentor rather than um just a reader uh the, i'd pick out some things some issues that they needed to address maybe the dialogues maybe show versus tale um but be you know if if you're an editor, a paid editor, um, one of the bottom line things, which doesn't always happen these days, you do not rewrite the writer's voice. Um, by imposing your own belief systems on how something should be written, you can rob the writer of their own voice. Mm -hmm. um, you can strip out too much um, or put in too much even. So um, that they're, you know, I've, I've been editing for a long, long, long time. And one of the rules that we had at the beginning was uh, you know the, the the author's voice is their voice don't mess with it um if they're grammatically incorrect fix it um if they have uh written i mean i used to do a lot of maths books and if they have written something that's mathematically incorrect it has to be fixed you can't allow them any leeway but if you but nowadays i do see and i hear from writers saying oh the editor did this the editor did that and i think well they shouldn't have that's the mm. bottom line they really shouldn't have they have gone too far imposing what they consider to be right and wrong but actually a lot of it is style you know um there are choices and how you deliver a message mm. and you know someone isn't really yeah um i can see jeremy's question about goldilocks yes what makes, yes um, well it basically i remember i can't remember who the, i think it might have been john mortimer um he said something like you know those bits in a book that you skip over don't write them <laughs> So, uh, you know, a, 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 a book can actually be quite short. Um, so long as it's pure gold, the reader will forgive you for having paid five ninety nine for a paperback that's only took them half an hour to read. Um, and equally, I don't want a book that, you know, I could break my foot if I dropped it on my foot. If it's a lot of padding and you think, oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, so it's, it's, ne it's not never mind the quality, feel the width. It really is the quality that matters. So it doesn't matter how long it is um and it doesn't matter how many chapters somebody said to me the other day oh you've got to have 32 chapters uh no uh no mm, yeah. um 
but there are so there are certain rules if you like I mean, one of the rules that um, I give to my authors is that if they want the book to have a spine so that it can go sideways on a shelf yes. they have got to make sure that it's about but it's got to be 80 pages, I suppose. Um, so, um, oh, somebody has appeared. Um, it's, it's, got to be, it's got to be 80 pages or more or you don't get a spine. So that is yeah. something that, that really does matter because if you haven't got a spine, you can't put the, the title of the book on the spine, which means it won't go sideways on a shelf, which means a bookstore's not going to like it. So, and also you lose it as well and it looks like a brochure. So yeah. that's a very, that is an important rule. The other thing that I have learned from um, along the way is that if you're going to be writing a novel, there are some, novels, Novels have a low price point um, relating to the number of pages they have. Very mm. often you might have a, a novel that might want to be 400 pages, but that makes, but you can still only sell it for 8 99 So mm. it's actually, there's not much profit in it. So publishers are not going to necessarily want to publish somebody, particularly a new writer who they haven't tested before, who's written a book of 120,000 words, yeah, because it's going to make it, it's going to make it too many words and too, therefore too many pages so um so i think there is that to think about i tend to for a memoir i think i think it could it could be as little as thirty five thousand words i would say but mm. i'd be interested to what you think i would think say probably 55 would be where i'd go for a bottom line which i think is what M mills and boone say but i would say probably up to about 85 90 000. What, what do you I think, think i think i think a lot of this i so say you're being um you're being shoehorned into categories which are uh, determined by publishers who obviously aren't necessary because they're the ones who are going to publish it for you. And mm. um, so if they, but I wouldn't want to produce say 80,000 words because somebody gave them that magic number, but those 80,000 words um, could have been edited down to 50,000 because there's a lot of waffle. So I would be inclined to sort of write the best you can for however long it takes. If you then find you've only got 55,000 words and the magic number is 80, you need to develop your story. I mean, to give you an example, I wrote a, I wrote a short play, uh, 25 minutes long, um, on a course. And it was pretty good, if I say so myself. It was performed and it, it went down well. And then somebody else said they quite like one uh, similar theme, but for an hour. And so I thought, oh, okay, so how am I going to stretch my 25 minutes into 60 minutes? Um, and so I spoke to the teacher, we were friends, and he said, don't just try and pad it. Do not try and pad it. You know, you really must come up with more scenes, more action, more development of the story, more about the characters. You probably need at least another two characters. So uh, it's the same as a novel. If you've written what you think was total story or uh, in your own memoir, maybe, and you've written 55,000 words and somebody has told you you need more or less, then it's a case of, well, don't just, don't just spread it out. Think about what extra themes you might cover or what extra characters might come into it if you want to make it longer. My main issue with writers is they tend to turn up with 120,000. So I can't cut anything. And you think, do you know what, you can. You could probably cut it in half. Well, 80, 000, 80 to 100,000 for a novel is enough for most readers. Um, so, um, and you find they can cut it down. Um, yeah. 10%, 10 of, of 120,000, it comes down quite dramatically. I mean, if you've only written a 2,000 word story, um, then you're cutting that by 10%, it's, it's neither here nor there. But if you take a novel that's 120,000 and you take off 10%, most pruning can be to 10%, that really pulls it into shape. Mm. Um, and so, and on the chapter length as well, I think uh, if you look at, I think it's a story called Silk, which is about the Silk Road. Some of their chapters are one page long, half a page long. And a chapter can a chapter has to deliver a certain amount of information and no more. There's no point just writing more because you feel it needs to be longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I, I have actually a couple of other questions that have popped into my head because I can see we've run out of questions there and then we'll finish. Um, one is, what are your thoughts on if you're writing a memoir in the present tense and then you want to have a flashback what are your thoughts on what the tense should be for the flashback i would go into past tense because you're describing what's happened in the past and it makes it quite clear to the reader that you are um you know you've dived back in time as it were 
Um, yeah, so the, I, I, I would say that too. I would say, and I'd just be interested to know if you agree with me, that if they're writing in the present and they want to flash back, they should write it in the past. If they're writing in the past and they want to flash back, they should, they should flash back to the blue perfect, the had. Do you uh, they, agree with yes. that? Yes, yes, they should. Um, the only problem with that is that if it goes on for too long, if the flashback's too long, it, it, get, it echoes too much. Um, yeah. you, you could, um, if you can break the scene up or so, you know, in such a way that it's clear that what's coming next is a flashback, either by putting maybe the date at the beginning of the, you know, where it starts. Oh. Um, and then you can, you can stick to just using simple past tense. Oh. Having lots of hads kind of echoes. Yes, uh, yes. Um, in the in a in a fiction situation, um, one I had a situation only the other day with somebody I was reading their their chapter, and they had presented the order of events for a particular day, not in chronological order, um, so that you know the day started off, they went to the library, then they did this and they did that, da 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 da, da and they ended up having a meal with somebody in the evening, and during the, literally waiting at the door to go into the house where they're going to have the evening meal, they flashed back to what they'd done earlier. So the day was choppy, to say the least, but they also had in their novel flashbacks to tw 10 years ago and 20 years ago, childhood and so on. And um, for people who, um, who want to have flashbacks, make sure they're their flashbacks to before the start of the novel. Uh, Not, that's I mean, a fantastic. I mean, you can have, I mean, I've got one in, one, in Deadwood where she wakes up the following morning and lies in bed and thinks over what happened the night before which was a sexual encounter. So I'd left the previous chapter that the, you know, the door opens and it's obviously gonna happen. And the reader thinks, oh, I would have liked a bit more detail, but they're not gonna get it. But the following chapter starts with, she lies in bed thinking back, and then she gives the reader enough of the flashback uh, to the previous night for the reader to know how she feels about it, not necessarily a blow by blow account of what happened. So you can, within a novel, flashback to something that happened yesterday, or you can remember when you met them last month. Um, but it needs to be that they're thinking about it as happening before, not just filling in the details, not just providing yes. the chronological logical order of things so yeah, yeah. Um, it's a sticky it's a sticky one isn't it and it's something that i find that writers don't necessarily realize they're doing but god it can be so confusing when they're up and down with it and back and forth in the times but i like what you said about putting the, a date at the top of a chapter because that does help to remind people and then try not to hop around within too many tenses within that chapter no. in fact probably not hop around at all I would well say. the simplest thing is if you can stick to one tense it's just some, it's less arduous for the reader they haven't got to have, they haven't got to have their wits about them too much they can just read it mm. and enjoy it mm. um uh, yes i would agree i can see you've got another quite another couple of questions here can you see them Anne, or do you want me to read what them about out? using present tense for flashbacks and past for the main uh yeah you can do that if, if, if you if you make it quite clear to the reader uh and in fact you see as soon as you go into present tense it becomes more immediate uh and it can be more you know if the flashback was to something horrible or something or something really nice uh, not just something ordinary, um, then you can actually deliver it much more powerfully if you use present tense. But it has to be quite clear that that's your your way of doing things. The opening chapters of a novel, or any story comes to that, train the reader to expect what's to follow. Not, not what's going to happen, but the manner in which it's going to be delivered. So if you write with a lot of humour, then you want to make sure there's some humour in the first page. So they think, oh, she thinks she's funny, does she? Um, you know, so they get used to that. If you're going to be deadly serious, um, then you need to make sure you stick to that the whole way through your book. So if you are in the habit of having um, present tense flashbacks when the main line of story is in, um, in past tense, you need to manage that in the first chapter to kind of uh, prepare your reader for the delivery style that you're going to use. Don't suddenly slip it in in chapter four. They think, what's going on here? So, you know, be aware that you, as I say, the first chapter has to, it's like a starter, the start of a 10. Um, and, uh, yeah, and there's one, oh, yeah. sorry, Mary, yes, I, it is only available on Amazon. Um, I could provide you with a PDF copy if you, if you contact me. Uh, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, 
And I think I think that's, that's I think that's there. the I think that's the end of it. I think that's been incredibly helpful, Anne. Really, Good. very, very helpful. I think there's an awful lot of lot of questions have been raised and answers have been given. And I encourage people to go and look at Anne's website, book, and various other things, um, and stay in touch with her. She she is a great editor i don't know how busy you are Anne. <laughs> whether you need any more work you did say you were ha ha retired so <laughs> i don't know what that means but thank thank you very much Anne, for joining us today and those of you who are listening please know that i do run other events there are these in in conversations every other week i'm running the a life story jar live um live story writing class once a month and there is speed write live every friday at 5 p.m dutch time which is absolutely free and they're all they can all be found on the virtual events page of my website joeparfit.com and uh, so thank you all very much for listening thank you for being there thank you for your questions and thank you very very much to anne thank you